Okay, so we possibly might end uh, just slightly late, um, but it'll only be about five or ten minutes or so. So it's my pleasure to introduce the third speaker in our forum, and that's uh, Professor Paul Spoonley of Massey University, and he's uh, presenting with uh, Trudy Kane, um, in, uh, that's presenting data from the integration of uh, immigrants program that is a forced funded program. Uh, Professor Spoonley has been working in this area for many, many years, so please join me in welcoming. Kia ora tata katoa, and I'm making a big new kia tangata on the Hawaii Fa, in the Mana, in the Waka, in the Reo, or na tangata feno, tena kato, tena kato, kia ora tata katoa. I'm going to skip quite a few of my slides uh, just to focus on, on one dimension of current diversity. And we are funded, as James has said, um, from the foundation on our MSI. And we're looking at a, a range of dimensions of, um, uh, just to explain, I, um, I look after objective two, Jacques looks after objective one. Uh, one thing he didn't mention, which I will on his behalf, he's done a very interesting report which is available down here, looking at the education occupation mismatch relating to immigrants. And the question is, how long does it take an immigrant to catch up with a, a New Zealand born in terms of occupation and income? So he's got a, a very interesting report down there. What we're interested in is tracking how immigrants adapt to New Zealand as well as how New Zealand adapts to immigrants. And so we've got a number of dimensions that are, that are focused there. And we've looked at employers, we've looked at employees, all immigrants from five groups. The five groups are listed there, Chinese, Indian, Korean, South African, and British. And we've been looking at networks, that's just starting. We're, we're doing some work around entrepreneurs that will be coming out later this year. But the key area that I want to look at, which is a product of growing diversity in New Zealand, are ethnic precincts, or the focus the co-location of particular um, communities. Now I'm only going to focus on one of these, although we could talk about others and how, how, that, uh, how that plays out. We are, we are focused, we are um, funded to look at Auckland and Hamilton. I'll be just looking at Auckland today. Um, I'm just going to skip past these. Now, the, the thing that becomes very obvious in terms of those of you who know your history in terms of a, a New Zealand and diversity is that our cities really have been very homogenous and it's only been with the post-war migration of Māori that it's began to change then combined with the, the arrival of migrants from the Pacific from the 1960s. Uh, really in terms of the separate countries and in particular the countries that uh, Jacques has mentioned, we are the most homogenous, and Ian Poole here at Waikato University has written a very interesting paper looking at exactly how homogenous our migration was through a colonial period. It really only begins to change with the arrival of Pacifica, um, but what's happened is the, the diversity that is now evident in our public spaces and in our cities and in the way in which our cityscapes have been changed is really much, very much a function of the last two decades, particularly, I would argue, um, post-2000. So the challenge is, how do we reflect this, understand it, and respond to it in terms of the, uh, chain, the, the, the super diversity of particularly Auckland? And I think um, there's a session after lunch that Raymond Stone is speaking at, Rena? Um, which will continue on with this theme. So let me just provide you with some, uh, some of the dimensions of what we've been looking at. The first is these ethnic precincts, we're really simply talking about the co-location of immigrants, and particular immigrants from one ethnic or immigrant group in a particular area of the city. We could do this in terms of uh, residential um, concentrations, but in this case I'm talking about the co-location of businesses. And are they evidence of parallel communities? Now, this has become a very big issue in Europe, particularly given the, uh, the bombs of 2005 in London and a growing uh, policy, but also particularly political concern in the last couple of years. I would also point out that it's, a, it's a, quite an issue in the States as well. So are they parallel communities that are not integrating? 
But we would also ask the question whether or not we're seeing these concentrations as a result of poor outcomes for immigrants in terms of settling here. Those are two slightly different questions. So in terms of ethnic precincts, we've got several data sources for us. We are looking <coughs> at ethnic entrepreneurs, particularly people like Kit Wong, who developed a, an ethnic precinct in South Auckland, which I'll talk briefly about. So they came here, they saw an opportunity and they responded to that opportunity by developing something which is very ethnic specific. Um, the second are business owners and, employ um, and employees. So we've uh, surveyed, um, we've surveyed uh, employers and employees and we're just in the process of conducting a follow-up survey. Linguistic landscapes I've come to, that's done by a colleague of ours, Robin Peace. And then we've also surveyed people who shop at ethnic precincts. Now the one thing that I want to stress at this point is that what we see, we're looking particularly at the Chinese, and I think it's important to say that the Chinese and Korean, and we've got the handouts here, kimchi networks and bamboo networks, the, the outcomes, the research that we've done with both employers and employees tends to stress the nature and the strength of co-ethnic networks for these two groups. We've completed the report on the Indians. The networks are not so powerful. The co-ethnic networks are not nearly so powerful there. And when we get to the British and the South African, even less so. So there's a very significant um, role in terms of networks for these particular groups. And I'm going to focus on, on the Chinese. So it comes from work um, by Cortez, relational embeddedness. You might know the work that's been done by uh, Jan Rat and um, Robert Klusterman around mixed embeddedness. We're actually taking it on and suggesting that in fact the mixed embeddedness uh, is less important. The networks here are very, very powerful and that there are certain advantages to those networks. Now just to, to, to come to a point that I've made and that I just want to, to um, embellish, we, we're struggling a bit because of course we don't have a census this year. So we can't do the 06, 011, um, uh, but what, what's significant here, these are all um, Chinese, so New Zealand born, but also those who've come from another country. What we, what we see here is a very rapid escalation in the total number of uh, Chinese over on the far right there. But what's significant <coughs> here is the doubling of the, those who were born in China. In fact, post-2000, 85% uh, of the Chinese immigrants who've arrived in New Zealand have come from PRC. So we've got a very significant um, growth in terms of both the Chinese population overall, but also increasingly Chinese from a particular source country. And when you, give an, when you, when you consider our history and the way in which we work very hard to exclude those Chinese right the way through uh, until the mid-20th uh, century, um, this, is, this is quite a contrast to, to, that, uh, to that past. And then what we've looked at, we've got the map here of where the Chinese are concentrated in Auckland. The dark red areas are those that are, those areas, the census areas which have more than 20% of their population who are Chinese. Um, <coughs> there's a, a very interesting pattern which you can see down through here and these are uh, the three ethnic precincts we've looked at. Coming through to Chelsea, there's a, a, a very significant CBD concentration coming and then splitting. The largest group of Chinese in Auckland are here in Waitakere, just on the, on the border at Linmore. And then there's this uh, belt on the peri-urban fringe, uh, which includes Meadowlands, which I'll, which I'll focus on now. So those are the three precincts that we've looked at. They're all quite different. Um, uh, the uh, North Coast is a conversion, so it's a, a, a suburb that was a suburb shopping centre which was in decline in the 1990s. Uh, there was quite a high vacancy rate, and the rents were dropping, and uh, Chinese owners moved in and have now converted this to an ethnic precinct. Dominion Road's really interesting. It's the longest road in Auckland. It's a very iconic road. There's a certain song about it. Um, it's also very significantly um, somebody's phone. But it has a very significant um, Asian and particularly Chinese, and in some parts of this, eight, more than 80% of this road are Asian, 
and more than 50% are Chinese. And then Meadowlands, which is a kit warm, uh, um, purpose built at a precinct. And that's just a. Um, um, let's, let's just focus on, on the Meadowlands ethnic precinct for, for a moment. It was, um, it was built in the late 1990s by Kit Wong. Uh, the reason for him building it is interesting. He had his parents, he's from Hong Kong, he had his parents here and they stayed for a while but then they went back to Hong Kong because they had nowhere to socialize, <laughs> nowhere that was accessible to them as elderly Chinese that could provide them with many of the, um, the social and cultural and linguistic landscapes that they were used to. And Kit thought about that after they'd gone back and he thought, well, what would be important to Chinese communities, including, of course, elderly Chinese communities? And the Meadowlands was, was built as, a, um, as part of what he thought uh, important. Oh, I think I have to go back for a second. Um, there's, there's a couple of things here. We'll come back to the signage in a moment. There are a number of shops and buildings which have no English whatsoever. And here's an example of one. The buildings are built on flat terrain so that elderly people, people who don't have cars, can get to it easily. They face one another so that there is a security, um, designed for security. Uh, and it's, it's branded very explicitly as a, as a Chinese precinct. How Chinese is it? Well, this, this, uh, the, these are the, um, the <coughs> enterprises that are there. Uh, you can see the gross percentages. 73% are Chinese, another 23% are other Asian. Uh, it leaves 4% other. Very Chinese. And this is a, a new development for Auckland. I mean, we had small areas around Grays Avenue, for example, of Chinese um, businesses in the mid 20th century, but this is a fundamentally a new development where it's, it's, it's built around um, food. You can see it's anchored by food. Food is very important um, for social and other purposes here. There's a range of other services that are provided. The large stores tend to be, of course, non Chinese. Um, so you've got an ASB and a Woolworths there. Which not. Um, this guy over here, this, um, uh, one of these uh, is a park guy who's, who sells um, liquor. But it's, it's very, very dominated by Chinese and is seen as a, a destination. We've done some GIS modeling. This is the product of that modeling. And you can see the, the uh, Chinese owners are reflected by the red. And you can see that again there alongside the, the figures. Now what's interesting here, and this is where Robin Peace is doing the work, is around the linguistic landscapes. The English, English in whatever form, spoken or in written forms, is a minority language in this ethnic precinct. The dominant language is Mandarin with some Cantonese spoken. And you can see the, um, the results of it in the almost complete dominance here um, of these shop fronts where there is uh, Chinese or Korean script. Um, Quite, quite a new development for Auckland, a really post-2000 development. Uh, here's some more examples. Um, this, interestingly, is a police notice. And in both the ASB and Woolworths, there are notices in um, Chinese script, even though they are not Chinese-owned. So don't be the next handbag theft victim, and then you've got uh, um, Chinese script there. And that's just one last example of real mixture of, uh, of scripts there. So the thing, two things that I want to end with. One is that having looked at um, the uh, Chinese employer interviews, what's really interesting is the depth of those networks and the reliance on co-ethnic. Now, when we say 100% employed at least one Chinese employee, that's not to say that all their employees were Chinese. It's just that all Chinese employees that employers of Ikebun that we have um, interviewed had at least one Chinese employee and then ditto with suppliers and then uh, uh, customers. There's a very strong reliance on um, co ethnic labour markets, suppliers, and on customers. And then you can see there the dominance of, in this case, it should be Mandarin, used with workers 95% of employers.
some very interesting strategies come out of this because, of course, um, these Chinese employers do need English. And if they don't have, themselves have um, sufficient fluency, then they employ people who do. So there's quite a market here for bilingual um, speakers of the language. The other thing which is, is really interesting from the employer interviews is the strength of their international connections. We have a phenomena in Auckland amongst these employers in which their international connections, or their non-Auckland connections perhaps is a better way of putting it, are really very strong in terms of a homeland and very weak with other parts of Auckland or with other parts of New Zealand. So quite typically, a Chinese employer, Chinese business owner in Auckland, will maintain very strong connections with a homeland through families, through business, through travel, and have very poor connections with other parts of New Zealand. And so they have a very um, significant international connection and a very um, poor local connection at this particular point. So why ethnic precincts? Are they important and are they going to exist over the long term? Well, yes, they are important. They are a very important access point, particularly for new migrants. And our, an assumption that I made some years ago in terms of um, profiling and anticipating the growth of Asian communities, not Chinese, in Auckland, was that we would have a net gain of about 20,000 per year. And that combined with out-migration, which of course has peaked again at the moment of people leaving New Zealand and particularly going to Australia, means that there's a, a, probably a growing percentage of Auckland and of New Zealand that are made up of these incoming Asian and Chinese. And these ethnic precincts provide a funneling point, a point of contact and a point of information. Very important in terms of people whose English language ability is limited. Um, we, did, we did ask um, on Chinese and Chinese consumers, and there are different patterns in terms of why people access a ethnic precinct. However, that said, one of the things that has struck us as we've looked at these dimensions, these products of the, of the urban landscape and the, uh, the impacts, I'll stick with the Chinese, but the impacts of immigrants is we really still don't know the size and the dimensions of the Chinese ethnic economy in Auckland. I mean, we've, we've, we probably know more about the Māori economy, as we've now called it, um, in recent years, particularly with the work of TPK and NZDI. But we don't really understand fully its dimensions in Auckland. And there, there is, a, there is a, a remaining question of whether those ethnic precincts are a function of first-generation Chinese and Asian migrants, and whether they'll begin to morph into something else later on or whether they reflect failed settlement outcomes. In other words, the Chinese might have tried the labour market, failed that, and have set up a food shop in Auckland uh, to compensate for a lack of success in the labour market. So I think we've got um, some interesting questions in terms of what people like Rena here is going to do in terms of Auckland Council into the future, how much it's going to recognise the, the, the growth of these very um, immigrant-related uh, uh, urban outcomes um, in terms of residence or in terms of business location. I think there is a broader question, which is a, a political question, which is that we've invested quite a bit into biculturalism, and there's been some work, James has done some, there's been some work around what it means to be a New Zealander in both a bicultural and a multicultural country. I think that's one of our most interesting challenges. Kia ora tata. I'll, I'll just mention, uh, Paul actually uh, is right there just before finishing on time, so he really was quite short. I'll take some questions, but also mention that the uh, CACR, Center for Applied Cross-Cultural Research, will post the PowerPoints. We'll also post a video, so those of you who want more detailed information, want to, I notice several of you scribbling furiously, you can pick that up from the internet. Just Google CACR, Center for Applied Cross-Cultural Research, and then eventually there'll also probably be a forum where you can uh, post comments and, and things like that. But at this stage, uh, I'll, I'll open the floor for questions or comments. Oh, Rena. Yeah, you're allowed to ask questions. Um, thank you, Paul, for, of course, as always, a very interesting presentation. I was curious to know if there was any exploration around the relationship with these businesses 
uh, I mean, I know about Kitwong, but the linkages with these, uh, with business associations, and you know, where is it? How is that panning out? Are there, is there something to be explored there? Yes, there's something to be explored. Yes, we did ask those questions, because part of what we're interested in is the way in which major institutions in our society are reacting to immigrant diversity. And, and, the, and, and many of them are not. And so when we asked the employers about which organisations were helpful in terms of settlement, the answers were very few. And the sorts of organisations we would typically think about um, don't feature. The ones that do feature, interestingly, are inland, inland revenue and also because many of these are food focused, training for food health safety is actually done very sympathetically and they regard, immigrants regard that dimension as being very helpful. And, and what I found uh, interesting in those answers, so the, the answer is yeah, they don't find many of the traditional organisations very sympathetic or helpful or supportive. And, and that's in spite of somebody like, for example, Michael Barnett um, and the Chamber of Commerce, which has been a really strong advocate for immigrant diversity and the, the importance of uh, um, employers recognising immigrants as a key source of labour. But it, it doesn't translate into how immigrant employers themselves see those organisations. More questions, comments? We can go to lunch, James. <coughs> Last chance? Okay, well, thanks very much.